Are you ready? Okay. Uh, can I start talking to that camera and then we in Portuguese? Can I do it very short? Of course. Please. Muito bem. No, anyone any anyone this one? Anyone? No, I mean it's, it's on. That one? It's on. It's just not getting a feed into the computer. Oh, okay. sure. I understand. Okay. Can we go? Pessoal, eu tô aqui no meio do Vale do Silício com um cara que é uma das maiores autoridades em inteligência artificial. Sebastian, thank you so much to, for having you. me here, Sebastian. O Sebastian é professor em Stanford, passou pelo Google e agora está numa instituição chamada Udacity, que é onde a gente está agora. Sebastian, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Can, can you try to, to tell people who does not know anything about it? Uh, and I want to say to you that we have a great artist in Brazil called Gilberto Gil, mm -hmm. a musician, uh, that during the 70s made a, a song about artificial brain, cérebro eletrônico. Mm -hmm. In the 70s, there was a, you know, excited about you know, artificial intelligence. What is the difference between the other excitements that we already have about this subject and what is going on right now? So artificial intelligence is effectively the science of making computers smart. Mm -hmm. So I'll give you two examples. Earlier this year in uh, South Korea, a Google-based program called AlphaGo beat the world's smartest and best human Go player. Mm -hmm. So obviously that program had an IQ, a, a Go playing capability that exceeded that of any other human being. Mm -hmm. That is artificial intelligence. Second example, I've been involved for many years with self-driving cars, mm -hmm. where the car takes the steering wheel and gas and brake and makes the driving decision. Again, it takes intelligence to get cars to do this. When you ask me what's different today, artificial intelligence, the word was invented in 1956. So it's actually really old, it's about 60 years old. Yeah. And in the 70s, there was a big wave of people building what's called expert systems. That wave kind of went away. In the 70s, people thought to make a computer smart, you have to extract the rules from a human brain mm. and have them write on all the rules that govern their behavior yeah. and then bring those rules into a computer. What we've learned since is that we don't instruct humans with the rules very much we shouldn't instruct computers with rules. So artificial intelligence today are learning machines. They're machines that sit there, watch, observe, interact, and learn from experiences. The machines are learning from who? Give an example. Um, when AlphaGo beat a human Go player, in the very beginning, when this program was just written, it was actually not very smart. And then it started playing. It started playing itself over and over again. Mm. And it looked into libraries of expert play, how experts are playing. And it started discovering patterns, patterns mm -hmm. that would increase the chances of winning. And then it would build on these patterns, meta patterns, mm -hmm. more complicated patterns, to the point that at the end, it played more than one million games against itself before it beat the human co player. Mm. Training. That's called training, yeah. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting because the way we teach people is very similar. Mm. Now if you get born in the world, mm. and our centers are full of data, even though we don't do very much in the first year or so, mm. and then we start crawling around and walking and we fall again, and we really learn by doing. Mm. And this learning by doing, that has now finally reached computers. Mm. So your computer can now learn by doing. And there's one very important difference between computer learning and human learning. And here's how it goes. When I, I used to work on self-driving cars. And we use the saying, if a human driver makes a driving mistake, mm. then the driver hopefully learns and avoids this mistake in her entire future. But nobody else learns. When a robot car makes a driving mistake, that robot car will never make the same mistake again, it learns. Mm. And so do all the other robot cars, mm. including all the unborn cars. I see. So to some extent, the ability for machines to learn, accumulate information and learn, is outpacing people's ability to learn. Machines can learn faster than us. That mm. means no matter what you look at, whether you're a lawyer or you're a judge or you're a, a medical doctor or you're a pilot mm. or you're an accountant, eventually these machines will be as smart as you are. Hopefully. Because uh, what is the uh, uh, irony for me is that when we say uh, artificial intelligence, 
it seems to me that we are trying to mimic the human intelligence, which is very fragile. You agree? I actually think we're doing something different. I think we're building superhuman intelligence. Mm. And there's issues of intelligence and, and human beings we leave out, like everything having to do with the moods, for example. Right? Mm. I don't want to come to my kitchen and have the refrigerator tell me it fell in love with the dishwasher, and as a result, it's not willing to cool my food anymore. Right? <laughs> I, see, yeah. I don't want moods <laughs> and, 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 and these kind of human traits. I want a reliable mm. machine. Mm. And if you look at the history of, of machines, of inventions, of technology, mm, mm. we've always built machines that complement people, mm. that don't replace people. Like a mechanical plow that you can use to, to plow your fields doesn't replace the human driver, but it makes the human driver a, a thousand times as strong. Mm. The artificial intelligence in the future will not replace us, it will make us a thousand times as smart. Mm -hmm. uh, in what uh, point that we are right now? We are, we are here at Silicon Valley among a lot of people thinking on this uh, learning machines and this revolution. What is the difficulty right now to, to push the barriers, to push the limits? I think we're just getting to the point where our computers are big enough our data sets are big enough. And I'd say our so-called neural networks, which is a computer software, is big enough that we can learn interesting things. Mm. Um, in the past, I would say the computers were of the size of a rat brain. Mm. And now we are getting to the size of a monkey brain or, or a human brain. And there's enormous difference in, in cognitive capability and intelligence from a rat to a human. Mm. So that, that line is being crossed right now at this moment. Now, what industry is doing is picking specific, very targeted applications. For example, sales conversations in an insurance company, mm -hmm. or legal document discovery for a lawyer, mm -hmm. or self-driving cars for, for cars. And these very narrow uh, verticals are now being substituted with machine, machine learning. What's completely missing is what we would call general intelligence. Mm -hmm. Any system that can reason over many, many different domains. AlphaGo can't play chess. The Google self-driving car can't fly an airplane. Uh, let's talk about the 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 car. Mm. The, uh, we, we, we what is the right now? We have different experiments and developments of software and hardware about cars. What are the basic difficulties to to go ahead? So my um, company, Udacity, actually just opened up a self-driving car education program. You can get mm -hmm. a nanodegree certificate from us. Mm -hmm. So anybody, and if we're going to translate it into Portuguese at some point, anybody in Portugal mm -hmm. can learn much more about it. But the interesting thing about cars, what's difficult today, it's still the intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's still to make them smart. Mm -hmm. Until about five years ago, people didn't even talk about self-driving cars. Cars were machines that would amplify our own muscles. Right? Yeah. You put the foot forward and an engine would rev up and drive you around. Mm -hmm. Now, the f attention is focused to the idea of cars being intelligent and making intelligent driving decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, when I ran the Google team, we got to a point where we could drive about 500,000 kilometers without any incident. Mm -hmm. It's a long distance. The car was, in my opinion, outpacing my own driving skills. In fact, mm -hmm. my wife would always urge me to let the car drive I feel safer. I yeah. kid you not. Um, now the next goal is to do the same in traffic, in cities, in surface streets. And I believe that Google is effectively at a level very comparable, if not better, than human performance. Mm. And then it's mostly now turning into products, uh, down-costing it, integrating it, getting the sensors to be robust enough to bad weather and so on, mm. and start selling those devices. Can you please just repeat the point? Because you said um, Brazilian Portuguese and then you said Portugal. Oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, this is bad. Okay. okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm sorry. So I'm sorry. Okay, what's the sentence that I, that I said? Yeah, you said um, that we just launched the self-driving okay. degree and that it's going to be translated to Portuguese, right? So okay. anybody in Portugal? Yes, in Portugal, but also in Brazil. Yeah, that's true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for, for <laughs> noticing. Good. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So in, in fact, uh, Udacity, my company, just launched an educational program on self-driving cars. You can go to udacity.com and find a nano-degree program, as we call it, where you can learn the ins and outs about how to make a self-driving car. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it's going to be translated into Portuguese, so it's going to be available in Brazil very soon, together with many other tech programs that Udacity offers to Brazilian students. Let's talk about Udacity. Why, what it is and why you launched this company? Uh, about five years ago, I was teaching at Stanford University. And as usual, I had about 200 students. It was a course on artificial intelligence. And then I decided I, I'm going to make this course available to the general public. Mm -hmm. And I sent one email, exactly one email, saying, look, pass this email on. If you want to take this class, you can take it free of charge. Mm -hmm. 160,000 students signed up. Mm. When I then taught my 200 students on campus, my 160,000 students all around the world, including lots of students in Brazil mm. and in Latin America, we found that the top 412 finishers, when you stacked ranked everybody, mm. were not at Stanford. And the single best Stanford student was number 413. <laughs> and then I realized, wow, we have phenomenally great students at Stanford, but there's even many more even more phenomenal great people that don't make it into Stanford. Mm -mm. Of all trades of lives, people from different geographies, people in different ages and phases of life, mm. people with disabilities, uh, young people, old people. Mm. Why don't we take what's so great about Stanford and bring it to the entire world? Mm. What if Stanford wasn't teaching 15,000 students but 150 million students? Mm -hmm. So that was the vision and then we quickly realized Stanford wasn't really on board with completely opening up and, and making everything free of charge. Mm. So we started a company called Udacity, and we started working with industry. Uh, we started working with Google and Facebook and Salesforce and Cloudera and many, many other companies uh, to really build a curriculum um, that is at the bleeding edge. Mm. And every time we go to a company, most recently, uh, Mercedes-Benz, for example, mm. Didi, companies we work with in a self-driving car, another degree, we ask the company, look, what would it take for you to hire a person? Mm. What does a person have to know? And then the company says, oh, you know exactly. Yeah. Number one, localization. Number two, this. Number three, deep learning. Mm. And then we take these things that people have to, to be capable of doing to show proficiency and turn it back into curriculum. Mm. That's how we design curriculum. And then our, our partner So it's the opposite of uh, a regular university. Yes. That bring a curriculum and try to fit into reality, let's Correct, say. because the companies that hire our students, they know the best what they want. Mm. And I think it's important that curriculum understands what it's for. Mm. A curriculum design is or an education institution is not for its own sake. Its, its fundamental sake is to empower its students. Mm. That's the number one reason why we exist. Mm. And empowering for curiosity means you can find a top-notch job in a place like Silicon Valley. Mm. And I can only guarantee this if I can align my teaching, my education, with what those top-notch companies want. Mm. And the nice thing is, they just tell you, they're extremely eager to get engaged. Mm. We've built more than a dozen courses with Google, for example, and Google instructors, Google staff, comes to Udacity to do the teaching themselves. Mm. It's so important to them to teach the right thing. Mm. And what are the, the let's say, uh, the side effects of having uh, l distance learning, because you you are you teach to and there's certainly a global uh, learning institution. So yeah. you, you teach online over distance. That's correct. W wha what does the online has to do to to keep the connection without this interactive live interaction? Every every medium is different. I would say theater is very different from television. It's very different from film. Online is very different from in, in classroom. And there's things that you can accomplish in a classroom you cannot accomplish online. Um, however, it's very feasible to keep up social relationships online. We mm. have mentors that work with students online. Most of us are on Facebook. We already know that we can keep up with friendships online. Yeah. The physical incarnation is not a requirement for having a, a social, deep social interaction. The nice thing about online is, in certain dimensions, it's much better than classroom. Uh, why? The most important one is mm. you can go at your own pace. Mm. In a classroom, a professor is forced to make all the students have the exact same thought at the same time. Yeah. And some are faster, some are slower, mm. some are tired, uh. some are distracted, mm -hmm. and all those fall behind in the learning experience. Online, we have students who watch the same video 30 times mm. until they finally get it. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take away synchronicity and allow people to go their own pace. Like mm. you can study Saturday night in your dorm, you can study on the subway. Then the next thing you realize is 
the lecture goes away. Because mm. the lecture is this medium that you only do when one professor touches to many people. Mm. And you replace the lecture by exercises. Mm. And what you get is a complete transformed learning experience. Mm. We have a saying at Udacity, you don't lose weight by watching somebody else exercise. <laughs> Same with saying what we learn. You don't really learn a uh, subject matter by just watching a professor talk about it. I see. Sebastian, uh, to finish our conversation, uh, we, in what part of time are we? Because we, we have, we are, we human beings are trying to understand why we are here since a long time ago. And we have the Renaissance. We have you were you were born in Germany. It's so many different things and histories uh, passed through Europe, and you know technology advances, and airplane, and the communication theater, as you said, with different mediums. Uh, why? What should we now look at? What are the inventions that are? right now uh, the main necessities for us to to live well in this planet first of all i would urge everybody to keep an open mind mm. we often have a mindset that we love our cell phones and we love our cars and, and all these things but our mindset often tells us that's it there will be no more interesting inventions mm. i i believe of all the interesting inventions that we can make as humanity, we have only made 1%. And 99% are still to be discovered. Only 1%? Only 1%. Until now? Until now. We have 99% ahead. 99% ahead. Uh. And let me give you some evidence for this. Almost every interesting invention, with the exception maybe of the wheel and the book, mm. um, comes from the last 150 years. Mm. Because anything you touch during your day, the way you eat, the way you behave, you move around, you communicate, these are things that are not very old. Mm. Humanity is 50,000 years old. Mm. So some of the last 150 years was privileged. Mm. Some of you managed to crank up in inventions. Now, why should this end today? Mm. In the next 200 years, with the current increase of pace, we're going to dwarf what happened in the last 150 years. Mm. So for example, I think we're going to find ways to solve energy problems with fusion. Mm. I think we're going to find ways to cure pretty much all cancers. Mm. We might find ways for us to, to live twice as long. We will be flying, ca flying cars, not driving cars anymore. Mm. We will have brain implants that help us learn much faster at an early age mm. and share our information. And these are just some examples that friends of mine are really working on today. It's not mm. very imaginative. And then let's leapfrog a little bit further and see what happens if you can take the entire human brain and upload it into a computer and back. That's going to happen. And when we try to do everything, as you said, we made some mistakes as well. What should we do to not, uh, you know, get everything wrong? Yes, yeah, so I believe in the good in humankind. Mm. I think all of us, deep in our core, care, are passionate, are compassionate, and care about people around us. Mm. So fundamentally, I don't think humans are evil. I think fundamentally humans are good. And you can see it in data. The world is becoming safer and safer and safer. Now, there will be accidents. No question, we had uh, nuclear accidents in the past. Mm. And hopefully we learn from those accidents to contain the technology we built so that it doesn't harm people. Uh, but I'm, I'm overly, overall, I'm very, very optimistic. We've always managed to contain technology and make it serve us well. And it's going to stay that way. When are you going to have fusion working? When? So I know of startup companies that believe a stable, sustainable, and harvestable fusion can be accomplished in 10 years. We have already had fusion on Earth. It just wasn't in a way that you could take on energy. So I think the bigger part is to have a sustainable uh, reaction that lasts minutes or hours, and one where can, you can really extract energy uh, for energy purposes. And f for me, that I was uh, a child that dream about driving a car. Now you are building a car that does not have to be driving, driven, right? Yeah. When are you going to be able to have this car? You can buy cars today with some of those capabilities. Tesla sells a car called Autopilot, where we can basically push a button and the car drives itself on a highway. No, but I, 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 I want your car. Um, the Google car. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, you, the I'm Google not car selling is it. yours as well. <laughs> I would argue um, <laughs> the technology is now ready uh. that it drives as good or better as a human driver, even in cities, mm. which is complicated and hard. 
Um, in Udacity, we are now starting our own self-driving car program. We have mm -hmm. a nano degree, and our students, our Brazilian students, will be able to program a car that runs on public streets in California and have their software tested here in the public. How cool is that? And we hope that within a year or two, we'll be able to reach the same level of capability as Google has in self-driving cars. A year or two? Yeah. Thank you so much. It's a real pleasure. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs> nice to have you here. Thank you. Muito bem. All right. Thank you so much. Good luck. Muito bem. Good.